play and even share with others. Uh, I want to get right into uh, this this episode, but before I do that, let me just take the time here to truly thank those of you who are reaching out. Um, financially, yes, it's it's very much appreciated and helpful. Uh, and I so greatly appreciate it. I want you to know how much it means to me that you are um, contributing to this and that it's uh, that you see it as something that's worthy of your support. And I want you to know how grateful I am to you for that. But I also want to let you know how grateful I am to hear from you. Communication means a lot and I love to hear your uh, communication in every form like emails and letters Uh, Julie your snail mails truly bless me I don't always get back with you on them but uh, just know that I read them I love them and keep sending them and the longer the better don't worry about that Uh, but your text your your emails your phone calls all of it means a lot just to let me know that I'm not just alone here sitting in front of a computer with a microphone and my books and speaking to the air it it feels good to know that you're there to know that the Lord is dealing with hearts and showing himself and revealing his beauty to those who are longing to know him And it's so encouraging to know that so many of you are and that you are uh, being blessed by what is going on on this podcast. And with that in mind, um, this this podcast will be a real blessing. I've got my friend Daniel Brown uh, with me today. Uh, We pre-recorded, we sat down, we had to kind of work out a time. Uh, during the weekend that we could sit down actually and have a discussion and record it. Uh, his work schedule and, and mine during the week never really match up. So we're Sunday is usually the only time we get to see each other. So we said, hey, after our services on Sunday, we'll go home to my house and we'll sit down and do this. And you'll see that we had kind of began to already have a podcast before we sat down started recording so we slowed it down said hey let's hit the record button before or record button before we go any further and uh, let the people kind of join in on this and we had no notes Daniel didn't come in with any notes or outline or book we did sit down for an hour and discuss what we were going to talk about we just sat down with one another and began to talk and I just kind of let Daniel go with it and go the direction he wanted to go. And I interjected where I could and when I felt like I had something to add. I think you'll enjoy it. It's just a conversation between two brothers who genuinely desire to know Christ, who are growing, still growing, ever growing in the knowing of Christ and he in the knowing of him is our greatest joy and we are we have fellowship in him when we're together and and I just truly um, enjoy my time with Daniel um, and I think you're going to enjoy hearing him as well you can I think we'll say it during the session or during the recorded part of this as well but I want you, I encourage you to go to his blog. He has a blog on WordPress called itsallhim.wordpress.com. And he puts um, sharings on that, and he's a great writer. And uh, I think you're going to really enjoy his posts. He posts from time to time on that, so I, I encourage you to go there and, and, uh, and read his sharings. You can also... Uh, email him and I do believe it's Daniel underscore Edward underscore Brown at gmail.com if it's not gmail it may be Yahoo but I believe it's gmail 
uh, Daniel underscore Edward underscore Brown at gmail.com. Uh, you can contact him there as well. But I do encourage you to listen or, or read his posts on WordPress. It's allhim.wordpress.com. So um, I won't uh, bore you with any more uh, formalities and introductions and, and announcements and all of this. So we'll get right into this pre-recorded session. When we end it there, I'll come back and uh, we'll chat a little afterward. We are uh, joined today, I'm joined today, by Daniel Brown. We've been trying to get together on this for a while with his work schedule and everything and my schedule just never seemed to work out. But I'm glad to have Daniel, man. I, I, I love to hear him share. If you want to uh, read his sharings, you still have the blog. Uh, yeah. What is it? It's allhim.wordpress.com. Wordpress.com. It's all him. Okay. <clears throat> we were just talking about, we were chatting about uh, the spirit, soul, and body. Yeah. And we just got talking about stuff, and, and uh, we were thinking, we just need to record this. <laughs> yeah, this, <laughs> this is a podcast. We already done, we've done a podcast already, uh, or at least about a third of one. So we figured we'd start it over and let you guys uh, kind of get in on it. So uh, I'm not going to waste time with just a bunch of stuff, but I want to let Daniel start this, and we'll have a conversation but uh, I encourage you to go to uh, it's all him dot wordpress dot com yeah, right. and uh, read read the articles that he puts there. He also has um, teachings that he does. Uh, you can watch them on YouTube. Um, go to uh, the CMI website cmintl dot org, and you can pull his classes up on the Wednesday uh, video and audio classes. So they're there <laughs> and. Uh, I would encourage you to listen to them. All right, Daniel. Okay. We just, I was, we were just talking about how <clears throat> I was reading through the normal Christian life. No, no, I'm sorry. The Watchman Nee's book, The Spiritual Man. And um, Watchman Nee, when he was 19 years old, he wrote a book about the spirit, soul, and body. And um, <clears throat> And in the book, he begins with, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's it's right in the very first chapter. He begins with uh, the creation of Adam, and um, and the scriptures are very clear in Genesis chapter two. It says, "And Adam was made a living soul," and um, it doesn't mention that he was made a living soul having a body. And uh, Watchman, he's pretty much saying, "Well, we know he had a body." And since he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, we also know that he had a spirit. So, so let's just let's just uh, let's just add to the word of God because we know it's there. And Adam was created spirit, soul, and body. There it is, and the proof of it's in the New Testament. May you, may he sanctify you, holy spirit, soul, and body. In the day of Christ Jesus. No, no, I'm sorry, I misquoted it. We're in for if if you go to the scripture, you can actually see what it says. <laughs> now, where is it? Do you know the? It's First Thessalonians five verse twenty two, uh, and that. it says, "In the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're you're made whole." Oh, buddy, King James say that, but King James says, "Yeah, maybe." Unto, I think. Oh, unto. Let's see what I'm, as if I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Raven's going to read it to us. Yeah, read there's it. a lot of different, there's a lot of different prepositions that translations throw in there. There's going to be, now, where is it until, going? yeah, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. So they use that verse. Unto. That's what that one says. Right, unto. Yeah. I, let me just make some some comments about what the actual Greek says right here. Go for it. Is, uh, unto is not at all appropriate mm -hmm. for that. 
great proposition. We've, we've studied it thoroughly. It's mostly in the classes that Raven and JW have done about being in Christ. It's the word in. In, yeah. in, in, in Greek, it's, it, 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 it's spelled E-N, really, uh, and Thayer's gives us some synonyms that are appropriate for it in English. It'll be <clears throat> in, by, what else? Are you, are you looking it up? Uh, no, no. Alright, so, uh, but I'm just saying that, that Thayer's doesn't, doesn't allow for unto or un, until or when or all these things that, that all these translations, most of them, will basically communicate a future expectation of the coming of Christ yeah. when what the actual letter of Scripture says is that you are made whole, <clears throat> spirit, soul, and body. Uh, and let me include you're preserved or yeah. kept, mm-hmm. unblameable or blameless in the presence, which is the, in the coming of Jesus Christ. So this, so when he, in his coming, it's actually, I mean, it could be said through his coming mm-hmm. that we are made whole and spirit, soul, body. Because the truth or the reality of it is just what the scriptures say. Adam was made a living soul. Yes, he had a body. He was only two parts. Adam, the first creation, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. Now we have Paul making a clear distinction between two men, Mm -hmm. the first and the second. He's laying out a judgment. And now we're in Corinthians 15. Right. That's the judgment that the Holy Spirit shows us. It shows us rightly dividing like a two-edged sword the difference between soul and spirit. And and that's the difference between two men. Uh, the first man was of the earth earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And so I'm saying, and I think that we're in total agreement, mm-hmm. that the cross, that the work of Christ... When we begin to see it, we see that the first man was incomplete and without spiritual life. And so, in saying that, he is dead in his sins and trespasses and sins, and he is death itself. Mm-hmm. But when <clears throat> when you're born of God, the Spirit of Christ comes into you through spiritual birth. And um, now... So wait a minute. Okay, you were ahead. talking about this before we started, and you were saying that you know the way they present it, and and I know it the way they present it as well. But this this thing about spirit, soul, and body. So we have our own personal human spirit, soul, and body. And so the way they present this verse we just read is that basically Christ is the means to make our spirit. Soul and body whole, right? Watchman Nee, Watchman Nee, is in that book, the Spiritual Man, basically taught. I mean, it's a big book. We're talking about three, right. three hundred page book. It is the foundation of Christian psychology. And if you talk to very many people, man, it is a pervasive um, doctrine. Yes, trying in, being a yes man, in Christ, amongst Christians. Yeah. Um, and man, you can talk to people that, that that they are they have read that book over and over again. And if you talk to them, there there are certain there's just no other way. You can't you can't see anything any other way. This right. is, anyway, because uh, they like to say because God's a Trinity, quote unquote. Right, man who's made in His likeness and image has to be a Trinity as well, mm-hmm. and uh, that's just not true. But when what what you're saying is that this whole about making you whole, sanctifying you holy, spirit, soul, and body, is that the whole, that what makes you whole, what makes, brings completeness, wholeness, um, is the spirit himself that was not there previously. That Christ by his spirit coming to dwell in you is what makes, brings the wholeness. Is that right? Now that's the truth. Yeah. 
you are complete in him. Right. And that's and that's a lot bigger statement than now you have spirit, soul, and body. <laughs> uh, you are you are complete in him. And I, I, I'm not going to, but it touches this subject that we're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Now, what, what Watchman Nee has taught and what is accepted <coughs> amongst most Christians is that God breathed into Adam the soul of life. He right. breathed, it says it says he breathed into his nostrils the soul of life, and that and because that word breath there, in, well, in Greek that word breath is is pneuma. Breath is pneuma in Greek. Right. It's also spirit. It's a broad term in Greek. Mm-hmm. It's not in Hebrew. We're talking about Genesis chapter 2. Right. We're talking about Hebrew scriptures here. Yeah. And if you know Hebrew scriptures, and you back up a little bit, you're going to find out in Hebrews chapter 1 that God breathed into the animals the breath of life. Yeah. And they became a living soul. That there, That's there too. So you're going to say the animals have spiritual life? You're going to say... You're deflating balloons, Daniel. Uh, well, I'm just... I'm you're just, ruining people's concept I'm, of watchmen need to. I'm just saying that this doesn't bear out. When you read, especially Paul's statement in, in Corinthians, that the first man was of the earth, earthly, he's soulish. He was made a living soul. And the last Adam was a life-giving spirit. That he is making a distinction between the first man, Adam... Being only two parts, right. soul and body, and Jesus Himself being Spirit, who comes and fills His house. Right. And so um, we have a picture, and I I just believe that that the Lord has has brought me through some things with view a view of the temple of God. Or I'm going to start with the tabernacle and go to the tabernacle of David, and then Solomon's temple, and I believe that these. These three houses, they represent the three days of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And, uh, and the particular condition of those houses, and let's say the first house under the administration of Saul, is the house of death. It's the Ichabod house. Right. It's the one that the glory departed from. And, and it was in that condition because it's a testimony of, of, who the first man Adam is. And um, if you remember, in the scriptures, we're in the, we're in the beginning of, of uh, Samuel, I guess, in First Chronicles. Mm-hmm. Can I count that too? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead and get into whatever you yeah. The details of it are that the people of Israel were getting their butts kicked by the Philistines, and they thought, what we got to do is we got to get God into our business. We need to get that Ark of the Covenant out of the Holy of Holies, and let's let's march it out. And then, if if we bring that Ark of the Covenant, it's going to be like a lucky rabbit's foot, <laughs> and uh, and then we can kick their butt. <laughs> we're, we're, we will win because we got to get God in our business. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. And. Uh, and so they brought the Ark of the Covenant there, and and it was and it was lost. And the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, and the glory of God departed. Eli fell over dead, and the house was called Ichabod. Now, now let's talk about what. The tabernacle of Moses. What what condition is it in now? It's, it's the Ark of the Covenant's not in it. The right. glory of God's not in it. The presence of God is not there. And you know we've we've been looking at that. At we we're, were talking about the house of God being three parts: an outer court, a holy place, and the holy of holies. The part of the the part that really is the holy of holies isn't there anymore. Right. And uh, and the part that is just a soul and a body, that's that's what remains. And it's an empty house as far as God is concerned. Um, I'm saying that that house represents at the first man, Adam. Sure. He's yeah. made a living soul. There's soulish life there. But as far as God is concerned, it's like Jesus saying, let the dead bury the dead. Yeah. Um, Adam is a man of death. 
he doesn't, you know, it's like, it's like the whole, <clears throat> I don't know, the whole world filled with zombies. <laughs> they walk, walking around, talking, reproducing. Uh, it's just death. It's death in a very active form. Functional death, yeah. <clears throat> Well, when Christ came, he died on the cross. He took that body on himself, and he shed that body. And so, let's say, let's say that the Ark of the Covenant represents Jesus, okay? Um, it, David, after, after Saul, which is also represents the soulish man, and, and the, the house of God is in this same condition for 40 years during his administration, Saul loses the kingdom. David is anointed king. He's anointed king over Judah. And he reigned over Judah for seven years. And at the end of that seven years, David took Jerusalem. He took he took Zion. <clears throat> and at that time, now David reigned 40 years altogether, but for the first seven years, he was king over Judah. Mm-hmm. And, then the, and, and then the rest of the 30 years, he was anointed king over Judah and Israel. Um but right there at that seven years into J- into David's reign, that's when he saw it, God put it in his heart that to bring the Ark of the Covenant up to Zion, and that the glory, that that he should bring the Ark, ark to its rightful place. Um, and it's very interesting that he brings the Ark of the Covenant up, and he basically puts it in his backyard, and they worship Yahweh there. With no veil and no rituals um, that were, I don't know, prescribed in the law of Moses. Mm-hmm. They did it all wrong, um, according to the law of Moses. Yeah. Uh, but it's a, it's a figure of, of Jesus of Nazareth, um, who also walked the earth for 33 years. Um, this tabernacle of David was uh, the Holy of Holies, just all by itself. Mm -hmm. Everything on the outside had been shed, just like a seed sheds its husk in in a burial, right? Right, yeah. Uh, The outer court, the holy place, it's not there. It's been removed. The external has been put off. Um. And so just like a seed, what we're looking at here is the meat or the heart of the seed. Not We're not looking at the husk. The external has been put away. Um, I just see Jesus fulfilling those words. He who loves his soul life shall lose it. Yeah. This is this is what Jesus did in the cross. He lost it. Um, he put away the old man. Um, and then... At the end of the 33 years, the house was torn down. Um, we can say that of the tabernacle of David, and we can say that of Jesus of Nazareth. Mm-hmm. Um, both of those are true. And then that same Ark of the Covenant was taken from there, and it was placed within Solomon's temple. And it was put in the heart of a new house, completely different house. And... Um, and so Solomon's temple comes to represent the new creation. And uh, the writer of Hebrews is... I, I believe that that he, uh, in chapter 9, the first half of Hebrews chapter 9, that he touches on a lot of this. Right. I mean, he says, that second house which is not of this creation. Mm-hmm. And so he's, he's talking about new creation stuff here. Yeah. Um, now... In Solomon's house, everything's bigger. The Holy of Holies is ten times bigger. The uh, in the holy place, there's ten lampstands. There's ten tables of showbread. There's there's just still one um, or golden. Place. There's still oh, just one golden altar, yeah. altar. We're talking about the holy place here. Yeah. The only thing that's the same is the Ark of the Covenant. Right. 
And um, and why? Because that represents this same Jesus. The eternal, yeah. Yeah. It is the same Jesus who is in you. Though we have known Christ according to the flesh, know we him no more. In that way. I changed it all. Yeah. Now he is, now he's in you. Right. If you're born of God. So the seed that shed the first man, and all of that was external and outward, and now it's placed within a new house. And um, and I say that house represents the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. That new outer court, that's so much bigger. I, I say it's God's people. Not just Jesus in a resurrected form. It is... Well, that is Jesus <laughs> in the yeah, resurrection. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then this, and I've said this many times, and, um, I've said, like Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many dwellings. Um, I think if you're used to reading King James, you're gonna, you're gonna read, there's many mansions. That's so confusing. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and with such a bad translation, of what Jesus is saying, and I, I'm, I've just always said that there are in in that part of the house there are many souls that are filled with Christ and dwell yeah. right. And um, and now I want to say that also that there's scriptures that say that there's one soul, and um, what does that look like in the in the tabernacle? What does that mean? How can it be many and one? That sounds like a contradiction. I understand. Right. Um, <clears throat> but I believe it's there, and I think it's depicted there in Hebrews chapter 9, about, I don't know, six. I think the sixth verse through. If you read on in that, uh, the writer of Hebrews is telling us that this house is a parable. He has divided it up from the veil, everything out, outside is the first house mm-hmm. and then everything within the veil the holy of holies he calls the second house right. and uh, and I I just believe that he is describing to us a house that represents the outward man and the things of man and then the holy of holies the things that are that come out from God and um, the holy of holies represents the spirit Mm-hmm. And um, and the spirit is the core, the heart of the church. There isn't any other core except the spirit of Christ. Right. And I think when you see him, um, your soul, when that veil is removed from your soul and you see the spirit, that this is the revelation of Christ. Mm-hmm. I believe that you see the new covenant when you see Christ. Um in Isaiah, the Lord says, this is my covenant with them, my spirit. Right. Um, you're seeing Jesus. Um, you're seeing the the one who is God's covenant placed in you. Um, Paul is so clearly saying that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Boy, All over the New Testament, we have scriptures that are saying that the fulfillment of of the house of God is found in the church. Know ye not that you are the temple of the living God. That's 1 Corinthians Mm -hmm. 3.16. In the beginning of Hebrews, I think it's in chapter 3, he says, uh, Moses was faithful in all God's house. And then, but but the son of God was faithful to unto... I'm not being over his house, which house you are. Which house he are, there. And uh, that was what I was getting to, is that the church is that house, and... And build up a spiritual house. Yeah. In Peter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, which is, boy, boy, I could really get off on that. I'm gonna... <laughs> okay, this house is a spiritual house. Let yeah. me tell you, I just wanna, I just wanna say, uh, so much of Christianity has got and expectations of a tangible house coming oh, yeah. in to be the fulfillment of Ezekiel. Yeah. To be the fulfillment of Ezekiel's third temple. You know, that stuff is just garbage. Yeah. I'm telling you, Jesus didn't teach that. When Jesus said in, in John chapter 7, he said, uh, he stood up and he said, out of your belly, he says, as the scripture says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. 
What scriptures is he talking about there? Yeah. He's paraphrasing, which is wonderful. Because there's no direct quote in the Old Testament, out of your belly shall live, shall flow rivers of rivers of living water. There are there are scriptures that the prophets, let's say Zechariah in, in chapter fourteen, it says, And living living waters shall flow from Jerusalem. And he and he says, some to the east, which is the desert and the Dead Sea, and others to the west, to the to the Great Sea, which is the Mediterranean Sea. Ezekiel describing the same the same prophecy, the same promise of God in Ezekiel forty seven. If you go there, you'll see that waters are flowing down into the east. Now Ezekiel is more specific. The the waters flow out from under the threshold of the temple mm-hmm. of the house. Where are the waters, living waters come? They're coming from the temple. Temple that has already been fully measured by the measure of a man. Yes, and Jesus that's Yeah, that's so good. Uh Jesus is telling us that that temple is his people. Yeah. And out of your belly shall flow these ri- living these rivers of living water. That's how God's people. And he says that on the last day, great day of the feast, yeah. Yes. And that's where he says it. Come unto me. Uh, there's another kind of a, you were talking about the Ark of the Covenant in the house. It's true, I think, that after the destruction of Solomon's temple, the Ark of the Covenant was never in the house after that. That's true. Until you read in Revelation, I think it's 12, Revelation 12, where he sees the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies opened up, and he sees the Ark of the Covenant. And he's seeing the church. He's seeing the people of God, really. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, to me, that, that that keeps the testimony of the houses you were talking about, and Solomon's house being the pinnacle of it, it keeps that whole thing in fulfillment mm-hmm. where, you know, here's this house being built and he says there's a greater house coming. This There will be another house whose glory is greater, mm-hmm. the latter house. Now, unfortunately, people are still waiting on that. But if you read Revelation without some dispensationalized bent, you realize when he sees the Holy of Holies open, he's seeing the people of God, the church, those who have followed the Lamb, all of that. You're see, he's seeing that in a finished work. Yes. Because it says there the work is finished, or I forget how it's worded exactly, that the, uh, you know, that, that final trumpet is sounded and he sees the Holy of Holies. I think, I think it kind of keeps in line what you're saying there. We're looking at the resurrection. Yeah. If you're looking at the Holy of Holies. Right. We're looking at the resurrection house. If we're looking at Solomon's temple. Mm -hmm. And that is fulfilled in Christ. Not not people getting new bodies. It is seeing the church as one body. I mean we're just we're just saying the same thing as that statement in Ephesians, there's one spirit. Mm -hmm. One body. And uh The the body of Christ is is obvious. It's obvious. It's a corporate body. It has one spirit, mm-hmm. Jesus. There is one body, um, and there's one soul living in in the church. You know, this is this is the fulfillment of a present resurrection. Uh, if there, if it wasn't true that the, if the resurrection was strictly <clears throat> future, when when Jesus was going to come down out of the cloud and and give everyone a new body, and that's when the resurrection would be fulfilled, as what so many expect as a general resurrection, mm-hmm. then there would be no place for Paul saying in in Romans thirteen verse eleven. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really like the Young's Literal where it says it's already past time for you to awake from slumber for, or from sleep. Right. He's talking about the sleep of death there. It's already past time. 
Uh, King James says it's already high time for you to wake from slumber. Uh, it's already time for you to awake from sleep if you're knowing the time. Mm-hmm. He also says that for us, it's already time for you. Meaning, if you're not part of the church, well, it's not time for you. Right. You're, you're not born of God. But for us, if we're born of God and we're knowing Christ, it's already time. And that's what I'm saying in 1 Corinthians 15. Mm-hmm. To me, he's saying the same thing. Those who are of the second Right. The Lord from heaven. That transaction has already happened where the resurrection has already taken place. You are in the resurrection. You're you have come from corruption to incorruption. That's the same same thing. All over our New Testament. If ye be risen with Christ. Right. It's on the basis of Christ's resurrection that you have been risen. With Christ, um, that's that's what Paul's saying. That's what the prophets have said. I'm in, I'm in, I'm going to go to Hosea chapter six. I think it's verse one or two where it says, "On the third day, he King James says he will raise us up." The, the Hebrew doesn't have a futurist a future tense. It just says like in, like the young literal, he hath raised us up in the third day, where right. we live in his sight, in in God's view, we live. In Christ, in union with Christ. Um, Isaiah 26 says, I like the King James on this one. Thy dead men will live together with my dead body will they arise. Uh, That's in union with Jesus. Jesus is the vehicle of the resurrection on the third day. That's There's the house he raises up the third day. Yes. And so Jesus coming, fulfilling all of the law comes and fills his house. He lives in his body, the church. Um, and she's risen by his presence. As as we as our hearts grow in the knowledge of Christ and the revelation of Christ, and that veil is removed from our heart, we see the life. We see resurrection life. Mm-hmm. We experience that. And as we see that, we see that the church is already risen. And that this is a finished work. It's part of Jesus saying, uh, if you destroy this temple, I'll raise it in three days. Yeah. That is the resurrection house. That's what we're talking about. It is Jesus, and it's Jesus living in the people. Don't you think that's part of what Paul is saying too about them who had overthrown the faith of some by presenting the resurrection as past already? To me, that's the same as preaching it as future, past and future, it's it's denying the present reality of resurrection. Yeah. Being not an event that comes and goes, may happen or has happened, but a person. Right. It would shipwreck it, it would shipwreck anyone's faith to say that the resurrection happened and you missed it. Right, exactly. And that's what you got saying. left behind. Mm-hmm. Well that's what who was that heretic? Who was it? That what he was saying? Anyway, whatever. It's oh, okay. it's in Timothy. Someone was preaching that the resurrection was past. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I was quoting. I right, can't remember right. the name. Uh, Hymenius. Yeah, Hymenius, and there was another with him. So, so we're not saying that. What we're saying is the resurrection is present, and He is a person, and He's in you, and that the church and Christ living in the people. Philetus, yeah. Hymenius and Philetus. Hymenius and Philetus. So. Let's say, that's, I think that's some of what preterism teaches. Sure, sure. That the resurrection or the coming of Christ was a past event. It happened in 70 AD. Mm-hmm. And I think if you ask most preterists, where is Jesus? They'll look at each other and go, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Because yeah. there's nothing present about it. And that's the whole thing. Because here, you know, their faith is overthrown, but the foundation of God stands sure. And that's what we were talking about earlier, kind of with the identity. The, um, I think this is what we've been talking about kind of coincides with, what is it? Uh, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. 
that's the one in the Holy of Holies. That is the one who stands there identifying the whole in himself. Standing there. And it's ever living to make intercession. That's not him pleading our case before God 24-7. It's him ever living and being in that our the intercession for us. Amen. You know, <laughs> and I think that's what kind of what you're saying. That's the reality of resurrection. Mm-hmm. That's the reality of salvation. Right. He has been made unto us. Mm-hmm. Right. Re- reconciliation, sanctification, wisdom. Right. He has been made unto us our intercession. Um, we don't have we don't have Jesus on his knees praying for Raven to get over his bad attitude. <laughs> Jesus don't let out. Jesus <laughs> is <laughs> Jesus is our intercession. Right. He is our righteousness and uh, Raven shared this this is beautiful about Jesus being the fulfillment of the things in the day of the atonement. Yeah. How many minutes we got? We probably don't. We no, probably, we're good. We're, we probably we're better not. 6 minutes in we're good. We got plenty of time. On the day of atonement, the high priest would go in there and he'd wear one garment and be white, mm-hmm. and he was one man. He appeared in the presence of God for us as one man, yep. one perfect man, one who had never sinned. He goes, he offers atonement. Now, Jesus never had to offer atonement for himself. Right. Uh, the high priest would. That was part of the ritual. He had to do that because <laughs> uh, he was because he was a sinner. Um, but then he would offer an atonement out in the part of the tabernacle that represents external things, mm-hmm. and he would sprinkle the sin offering on those things all through part of the house that represented earth and outward things. And that he would go into a part that represented heaven itself. And and he would offer and cover. He would put life on everything. You know? <laughs> That's what was yeah, sure. that was what was being seen in the heart of God. Yeah. Life between the cherubim. Mm-hmm. Um, we're talking about God's view. We're, this is when when he shed blood and put blood on it. And on the four horns of the altar and all that. He did that. He did that all the way through. And then he came out and had to wash his, wash himself, wash his clothes. And then he put on a different set of garments. Mm -hmm. And, um, he's still one man. And he, uh, I I just see, I don't know, a good verse that, uh, is in Romans. If, if we were reconciled through the death. Much more shall we be saved in life. Yeah. And so, he, he, he made an offering in the outward parts, in the parts that were death. Mm-hmm. And then he went into to the life, and there's an offering there. And I think that that same distinction between death, the death of Christ, which is really the fulfillment of taking away things that needed to be taken away, and then life is adding yeah. the life that we didn't have. Um, that stuff can be seen in the goats too. You got two goats. You got to make. It, we're gonna. He, he uh, I guess cats cast lots to decide which one will be which. And one of them, and the first goat dies, mm-hmm. and the second goat is the only living sacrifice in all of the law. It takes away sin, and it. it I puzzled about that a long time. Waited on the Lord and asked Him to clarify. And had no idea, <laughs> but I, I just saw I just saw Jesus as the resurrection. I'm talking about for 40 days, Jesus of Nazareth showing himself, showing, putting it, letting people put their fingers in nail holes yeah. and things like that for the taking away of sin. Yeah. I, I I believe this is that has to do with the fulfillment of the scapegoat because he's because this particular <clears throat> goat that's living. Is has one purpose to be put out of view, and so Jesus of Nazareth, Absolutely. that form of Jesus that we once knew according to the flesh was raised from the dead, but it had to be put out of view. Second yes. Corinthians chapter 
5, though we once knew him, I think it's verse 16, I can't remember what verse the address is, but though we once knew Christ according to the flesh, know we him no more. Yeah. That particular form of Jesus of Nazareth has been put away. And um, he was instructed them of that too during those days. Yes. I mean, he just kept saying the same thing, like this, uh, the road to Emmaus, how they finally see. Well, let me start with the very first thing he said in that. Do not cling to me. Right. Exactly. And then the road to Emmaus. Now we're, now we're towards the end of that. Yeah. There's multiple times where that was so. Instructing them not to look in that. Because now we're to know him by his spirit and by his presence. Because what he's ushering in has no evidence in that realm at all. Yes. And that's, that's the problem with the temple, that's the problem with the house of God, that's the problem with the resurrection. All the things we're addressing is people's insistence on making those outward, natural things and missing the reality that is inward. Mm-hmm. The inward presence of the man who has made, brought this wholeness, the spirit. Because I think I remember reading, uh, who did I read? Uh, Oh, somebody's book. I can't remember. Uh, one of the, it may be Andrew Murray. I think it may be. Anyway, he said that the one thing about our salvation is people's ignorance of its nature. And that's that it is spirit. And only spirit. And I think we lose sight of that. When we're talking about the house of God. We're talking about resurrection. We're talking, whatever it may be. We lose sight that we're addressing a spiritual reality. Spirit himself. If this is not a spiritual house that we're talking about, mm-hmm. then Peter's wrong. Yeah, he's living. You're not a living stone. God's going to get some other stones, and He's going to build up a great big house over Jerusalem to fulfill. And Jesus was wrong. And and um, what you know, as far as the, all the promises of God being yes and amen in Christ. Well, only some of the promises of God are yes and amen. And the work of Christ is not sufficient. There has to be something else God has to do. Uh, And now, since this this third house is Ezekiel's temple, and it's going to be as big as Europe is itself, uh, it's going to be so big that the earth is going to spin lopsided. um, Because now it's going to be real. Now, we've got to have sacrifices. That are going to be no. Of course, they're just going to be a memorial, a memorial of the work of Christ. Yeah. But you know, we're gonna we're gonna kill doves. We're gonna slit the throats of of lambs. We're gonna, that's gonna oh, God's gonna allow all that in a millennium. Reinstitute it, not just allow it. And 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 for you that are listening, this is actually what most Christians today believe. Fundamental. Christians. Dispen- dispensational. Yes. Dispensational Christianity. Yeah. This is a skeleton in the closet. A lot of people, if they'll, if they'll really think this through, they'll say, it cannot be. Yeah. Um, but but uh, it, this is foundational stuff. You'll find it there in, in Lewis Schaefer's writings about dispensationalism. This is textbook dispensationalism. It's basically an externalizing of the promises of God. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and it's just to say that Jesus is wrong. Yeah. Jesus was wrong about saying that the fulfillment of the temple and living waters coming out from it is going to be out from your belly, mm-hmm. out from the church. Jesus was wrong about about uh, that this generation will not pass away to all, all these things. Yeah. Jesus was wrong about, you know what? And Pete Paul was wrong. And they were all looking for some thing that never happened. The writer of Hebrews was wrong, said, you know, you don't have to, you know, that we, that he will not tarry. He will not wait. Right. No. Any doctrine that begins with Jesus was wrong <laughs> is false. Because we are wrong. Yeah, that's uh, it. That's right. And, uh, and that, is, that is the way it is. Yeah, maybe we should look at our interpretation of things instead of saying Jesus was wrong. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, our interpretation is that me getting a new body is the resurrection. Right. And Jesus is wrong about him being the resurrection. No, no. 
Jesus is the resurrection, and so he is spiritual life of his body. Well, the Hebrew writer plainly says that the women who would receive their dead back wouldn't receive their dead back. I think it says wouldn't receive them back to life again because they knew there was a greater resurrection. A better resurrection. A better resurrection. That shows you right there the distinction between the two. There's something. The first one is you coming back again or someone coming back again. The other is Christ. Yeah. That's the better resurrection. Amen. And the whole distinction that we're talking about that everyone wants to still push off into the future is handled right there in Hebrews 11 and 12. You are come. Everything that he poses in in the the 11th chapter, in some way, shape, or form, he he declares you are come to it in Christ. Yes. And now for us, it's looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, meaning the origin of their faith that looked afar off, and the substance and consummation of faith, which is Christ in you. I mean, to me, that that's the distinction between, in the whole scripture, the entire thing. There was an age that looked for it, and now there's an age that is exists because he is the substance of it. Mm-hmm. And everything, and, and, and the whole point is, one was outward, one is inward. One is natural, one is spirit. First the natural, afterward the spirit. And the spirit has all the sufficiency of all those things in itself. Yes. And the thing that, that I was... If we allow God to show it to us in its true nature. Yes. In substance, mm-hmm. instead of looking for it where it won't be found. You very clearly um, shared this in, in many times, talking about how the law, if you understand it in the original Hebrew, it does not say... No, don't do this. Thou shalt not. There's nothing negative if you're seeing. Right. In literally, the literal (laughs) uh, Hebrew is, you do not. Yeah, you do not. And I, and I, I just see that as what Paul was saying that in him, we have the yes. Amen. Mm-hmm. That our message wasn't to yes and no; it was yea and amen mm-hmm. in Christ. If, uh, if you if you really see past this, I don't know this old covenant, these words mm-hmm. to the Spirit, and you see what the Father was doing and how He was clothing them with His Son, He is saying, "This is not who you are." That's right. You don't do this. Because he wasn't giving them a potential for achieving that. Or even giving them something he knew they couldn't do. He was all, it was, it was all, it was, like you said, clothing them with the testimony of that son so he could deal with them in that context. But it was also prophesying to them the one that if they received him, these things would be realized in absolute fullness. And so, Matthew 5. and so it's an affirmation. It's affirmative. There's nothing negative there. There's not a no. Right. Don't do this. If there is a, this is not who you are. Mm-hmm. Who you are is Israel's my son. Mm-hmm. Let my son go. That he may worship. This is God's view. That's what He's communicating in the in this, especially here when 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 you've got the first set of commandments was given and heard and the people. Ran away. They stationed themselves nine miles away. Mm-hmm. And the first commandment that they got was the first commandment they broke. You show, you know, uh, when they, when you see it as something that you have to fulfill and you have to be, didn't mix, they didn't mix it with faith. And, and then, and, 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 and in that perspective, the law came that transgression might increase. Mm-hmm. But that's not God's first purpose that's not God's first intention in giving these this ten commandments it's it's to clothe his people with his son and even the abounding of sin or the transgression increase was just a further expounding of their need 
to receive the one of whom that was a testimony. Yeah. You know, it was always him you know, in focus. And so that first set of commandments, that first understanding was broken. And Moses came down and threw those tablets down. Now, this time he goes up on the mountain and he prays for them and they and they receive forgiveness and uh, and then he receives a second set of commandments. This time he sees the glory of God and he's transformed in that view. Yeah. And he's glowing. He doesn't know he's glowing. Exodus 33 says he wist not that his face shone with glory. That's uh, King James. Bible in basic English says he was not conscious that his face was shining. And so Moses experiences the glory of God and what he's he loses self consciousness in, in the whole experience. He comes down, scares everybody. But he's got the second set of commandments and they're the ones who get placed there this is the covenant that gets placed on the inward parts. It's a covenant comes with a shining face. This is what God is is declaring. He's he is causing people to there's a first covenant and a second covenant depicted in this whole experience and that's what Paul is talking about he's bringing all this out when he talks about we with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord Mm -hmm. are being transformed into the same image from glory the glory of the first to the glory of the second that's that's what he's talking about there He's, he's bringing this whole thing out when he talks about beholding the glory of God and he and he tells us real plainly now the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Yeah. And so the freedom is, part of the freedom is, you not knowing yourself, you knowing Christ. You not knowing. Your view is not of you as an individual anymore. Your view is of Christ living in a people. You lose your view of you. It does. It's 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 so it it's so demeaning to say that the your wholeness is you becoming spiritual again. Your wholeness is you becoming a spirit, soul, and body, and an amazing Christian. No, no, that stuff. That I really like watching me. I really, I really, I really, I really think that the normal Christian life is a very clear depiction of. The New Covenant relationship. But when you go back to this book that's The Spiritual Man, understand Watchman Nee wrote it when he was 19 years old. And if you read it, the first preface is a nineteen is written by a 19-year-old. And the second preface is written by a much older gentleman who has had experience in the presence of God. And if you read his second preface, it's much like a disclaimer. He makes it sound like, I'm just telling you, if you read that second preface, he he makes it sound like he can't fully endorse what he wrote there. Um, he says something like, well, although I agree with everything that is written here, uh, I wish I had the preface in front of me and I could read this particular thing anyway. I'm just saying he goes all through it and and in so many ways he talks about self-consciousness is not anything that bears fruit. Right. And um and all that needs to be said because the whole the whole book makes it sound like Christianity is a restoration of a human spirit mm-hmm. and regeneration is a is your spirit restored? Like you had this, like you had this part of you that is spiritual, mm-hmm. and that's pretty much what they're that what they're saying is is that Adam was spiritual in his creation, and that when he sinned, his spirit died, yeah. and that regeneration is the restoration of that human spirit. Yeah. Well, what we're saying is is that Adam was death; he did not have spiritual life, and that when Christ comes into you. Now, you have spiritual Their spirit. Yes, and that's that's something very different yep. than man again. Yes, it's not I but Christ. Right, not I but Christ liveth in me. Yeah. Um, 
It's not me again. Not me made better. Not me made whole. But you are complete in Him. And um, and who Jesus is is one new man. And um, I've always I, I lost uh, this guy that used to call me constantly. Uh, and we had really good times together talking, but this was the one thing he wouldn't go there. He was uh, he was adamant about that human the human spirit, and we talked about it. And I thought we'd you know kind of agreed, but apparently not. I never heard from him again. But to me, the whole idea of human spirit is this fallacy or this basically this desire for man to have some spiritual capacity separate from God. Maybe God put it in you. But it's a, it's our own individual spiritual existence. And the, a new birth is basically the rekindling of that. It's like a spark that re-energizes our spiritual selves. Right. You know, instead of what you're saying, there's only one spirit. There's one spirit. There's one man who is spirit. And the whole work of God is not the restoration of man, man's spirit. It is the spirit of one man, the spirit of the perfect man, now dwelling in the soul. Right. That's Jesus' teaching. Yeah. God is spirit. Yeah. And the true worshipers worship him in spirit and truth. Mm-hmm. Um, that's in God's spirit. God is spirit. I mean, the implication is, Man is not. (laughs) God is spirit. Man is soul. Um, Now, Watchman Nee jumps on a couple statements that are in the New Testament and really twists them. Um, And they are kind of hard to understand. I'm just saying, you know, when, 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 when Paul writes, God's spirit and our spirit are made one spirit, people just assume that God's spirit... And our spirit must be there's a human spirit, and they're two separate things. Mm-hmm. Um, the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. That's in Romans chapter 8. Well, it's just that God's spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are sons of God. It's because God's spirit is your spirit. The only separation that's, uh, people get all confused on that. You know, you just, I'm just telling you that the natural mind lives in the natural. The natural mind lives in time and space and assumes God's way up there and over here. The natural mind perceives not the things of God. Right. Um, because they are spiritually discerned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm saying that that when the soul begins to experience the unveiling of Christ, that we are taught by the anointing. Um, when have not that any man teach you, you know, have not that you be taught by the book that's 100, 300 pages long called The Spiritual Man. <laughs> that you need to be taught by the anointing. Yeah. And the anointing says that this is my covenant with them, my spirit. Not a human spirit made perfect. This is God, the presence of God coming into you. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's, the presence of God comes into you, spirit, soul, and body. I think that's depicted in the, in, uh, uh, the Holy of Holies, in the Ark of the Covenant. You've got this, this, uh, this God raised almond tree. The genuine article, filling, basically replacing what is a a man made sculpture of an almond tree. Mm-hmm. I believe that's that represents the the part of the the mind of man, the natural mind, and you have to basically you have everything you need in this spirit, yep. in this ark of the covenant. Yep. You have basically a God, this a. A God raised understanding. That's the mind of Christ in you. And fruitfulness. And we, we all know those scriptures. Yeah. First Corinthians one twenty four says, we have the mind of Christ. 
Yeah, that's Second Corinthians. Uh, I, I, mean, I get the address. Of Romans right. chapter two. Yeah, chapter two. Thank you. And uh, and we have these verses that say Philippians two thirteen says God works in you both the will and to do His good pleasure. So that's the will of God working mm-hmm. working in you. It's not the will of man. Right. Um, I never found a verse that says you have the emotions of Christ. In the Greek, I there's a there's a verse there that says in Philippians three ten that I may know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. Mm-hmm. In the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. You can look at that just outwardly and say, Man, I need to know Jesus in the fellowship of his sufferings. I need to yeah, sure. I need to get whipped. For the gospel, I need to have some experiences that are negative circumstances where I'm rejected. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's what Paul's saying there. You look up that word yeah. in the Greek, sufferings, mm-hmm. and um, in many places it's used for emotions. We're talking about passions. It says passions. Um, that word is used for, somewhere in Galatians it says those who have been crucified with Christ have crucified the lusts and Most passions of the flesh. Anyway, uh, that's that same word that Paul uses. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I think that Paul's talking about something inward. I want to know him in the fellowship of his heart. Mm-hmm. This is a man after God's own heart. Fellowship of, I think it can be said. Properly translated, I want to know him. The fellowship of his passions. That's that's our heart experiencing Christ from the inside out, from the Spirit filling our soul. I, I think that's what I see when I when I when I say, you know, that the soul of Christ has expression in His people. Um, Young's literal translation says, "Let me find. I got. I got to look this up." Yeah, go um, okay, I'm in Philippians chapter one, verse twenty-six. Only worthily of the good news of Christ conduct ye yourselves, that whether having come and seen you, whether being absent, I may hear of you and the things concerning you, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one soul. Hmm. Striving together for the faith of the good news. Now, where is that? That's uh, Philippians 1, 27, Young's Literal Translation. Because I can't remember the address. So it's the Young's Literal. Yeah. Okay. And uh, anyway, that's that, that one soul is Jesus. The Spirit of Christ. I mean, we have other statements in the New Testament that say... Um, being renewed in the spirit of your mind. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in Romans it says, uh, having the mind of the spirit. Anyway, that's, that's. I mean, I, I just assume the mind is is a soulish function mm-hmm. and that, that the spirit is, the soul of Christ is animating his body, the church. And that that's the one soul, it's Jesus. Right. Um, and Jesus living in me is rest for my soul. Yes. Um, fulfill ye my joy. Okay, I'm quoting Philippians two two. Okay. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye may mind the same thing, having the same love of one soul, minding the one thing. Of course, that one thing is Jesus. Um, of course, what we're saying is when we, when we when I you know lay all this stuff out, I I believe that the writer of Hebrews is is. Showing us that the mind of God is that this one soul, this one spirit, you know, this one, the spirit of Christ in you has everything in it. It is sufficient for this one expression. I don't dare say what that looks like. No, no, that would, that would not be good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm saying, that the testimony of Jesus is found right there in the tabernacle of the testimony. Right. Um, that's another verse in the Old Testament. Yeah. Tabernacle. The tabernacle of the testimony. It means it's a 
testimony. It speaks of something beyond itself. Mm -hmm. uh, it speaks of Jesus. Now I know with certainty, Raven has taught on this, and it's excellent about Galatians two twenty. How, how much time we got? No, no, we're we're fine. Go ahead. <clears throat> Where it says, "Not I, but Christ." Mm -hmm. The Greek is not ego, but Christ liveth in me. Right. Um, there's nothing of, and I assume the ego has to do with my seat of consciousness as a soul. Uh, I assume the ego of the first man is uh, not, has been made not by the cross. And that there is no other but Christ. Christ liveth. <laughs> uh, in the, in the, there's, there is an expression of ego there in, that, in John 2, 24. He who loves his soul, I shall lose it. Right. And Jesus, you know, it comes to where I am, mm -hmm. there my servant shall be. That word, I, I, I am, is ego. Yeah. Ego. And um, I need to see this in the Lord, but certainly this is not about my soul becoming Jesus. <laughs> uh, that's silly yeah, stuff. It is. Me as Christ. What a poor, yeah. Well. We had somebody come visit with us that uh, thought he was Jesus. <laughs> yeah, we did. He had really arrived. Yeah. And uh, he was once where we are, but he's evolved. I'll say, I'll say this, Father. I, I he he has dealt with that old man, put him away, and he sees his son. He's completely as patience yeah. for that kind of ignorance. Sure. I don't have any patience for that kind of <laughs> ignorance. Personally, I'm telling you I wanted to pop the guy in the back of the head and say, yeah. You're not you're not Jesus. Exactly. Yeah. Um and it shows you we've been talking a lot about God's perspective, God's perspective, God. And man, thank God that's uh I mean thank God that's true and that he deals with us according to that. Because that's the only thing that keeps Keeps us. Amen. It keeps all of us. And that's so that we it, can grow. And that's beautifully stated in this verse that we started looking at in Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And uh, it says that you, King, or the Young's literal says you're preserved, right. blameless, in the coming of the Lord. Yeah. Um, that you're kept. Kept by the power of God. Blameless and whole mm -hmm. in the coming of Christ. I mean, that's what Paul is writing yeah. to the church. That you're, and, and when he uses that word, kept, the Greek word starts with a T, I can't pronounce it. I'm just telling you that because the Spirit of Christ is in you, you are blameless, you are sanctified, and you are whole. You're complete because Christ is in you. That's what Paul is declaring to the church. And he's, he's, it's really a blessing. May the Lord keep you or preserve you. Whole, blameless or unblameable, uh, in the coming of Christ. It's 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 he is saying that you're already in a state of blamelessness. You're already in a state of holy and whole, that you're kept, that you're preserved there, and you basically see it in his coming. You see yeah. the condition you're already in. It's, it's saying the same thing as First Corinthians one, that you lack nothing as you await in the coming of the Lord. You come behind in no gift, as it says, or that's grace. Mm -hmm. You lack nothing of the grace of God as you await the coming of the Lord, because the coming of the Lord is the seeing of what you've already been given in grace. Yes, I mean he goes on to further state that at the end of that same chapter. And then Peter says, you are kept by the power of God unto the salvation that is ready to be revealed. Mm -hmm. And that's a keeping. That's a garrisoning about of a soul that is set. It's already, as he says here, that are partakers of an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away. And we are kept 
and such a state unto the coming or in the revelation or, or unto the salvation that is ready to reveal. Because that's the salvation we have. And that's the salvation God desires to reveal. That's the only future aspect of this. Mm-hmm. Is we haven't fully in our soul, in, the, in man's soul, we, we haven't learned. Yeah, realized. We haven't been taught completely. We don't, none of us have the full counsel of God between our two ears. Right, exactly. Um, we know in our spirit. Mm-hmm. That Jesus fills this house completely. <laughs> that He is, that He, He doesn't just reside in your spirit and uh, leave you to yourself. <laughs> he doesn't. Right. He fills His house. No man ministers. That's right. We know it. Um, I'm just saying that uh, that we're in His coming, in His presence. That we see what is already true, and that and that's and, and that's expressed in that word "kept" or "preserved." Mm-hmm. Um, in the in what Paul originally wrote is that the Thessalonians would come to experience what's already true at His coming, right. and uh, in His coming, it's the original language, um, and that's just saying that it's basically His coming that. Causes you to see that. You yeah. realize in his, in his appearing or in the coming of the Lord the wholeness of man. Yeah. Which is spirit, Christ yeah. in you. It's in us seeing the resurrection. Yeah. And that Jesus is. Mm-hmm. Pre- in the present reality. <clears throat> um, anyway, I think all that's beautiful right there in, yes. in, in, uh, in Thessalonians. And it's the right way to look at. Uh, what Paul has written about spirit, soul, and body. Mm-hmm. It's Christ. Jesus alone mm-hmm. is tripartite, if you want to say it like that. Um, he's spirit, soul, and body. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, Absolutely. In the resurrection. Not Adam. No, no, no man was not that in the beginning. And um, he is, it's all Jesus. Well, man, I think we'll stop there. We've gone a little bit over our time, but it's been great. Enjoyed having you here, man. We'll have to do this again. All right, guys, I hope that was a blessing to you. I really do. I think it was. I enjoyed my time with Daniel. We'll have him back to be able to uh, share further on these things. And this is... uh, this was a good conversation. Probably some things that were said were maybe uh, different than what you've heard. Uh, unfamiliar territory, if you will. Put it before the Lord. We There are many things that we will say as things that we are convinced of in Scripture. And the Lord will appear and either confirm those things in His very being. Or... He will uh, overcome those assumptions in the light of the truth. And so I ask you to uh, put these things, as with all of these podcasts, put it before the Lord and say, Lord, if these things are so, if you are uh, who this man says you are, if my salvation is what he declares I want to see you in this way. I want to know you as you are. That's what we do this for. We set these things, we set these words before you that you will take it before the Lord so that you'll see God's final word on it in the revealing of Christ himself. So, uh, again, thanks for listening. Thanks for taking the time out of your day. Uh, Hopefully, uh, wherever we find you, we find you well. Let me just say this new year, um, I've got some ideas uh, that I'm considering. Some ways to uh, minister to you and reach out even more. 
and that has to do with uh, traveling and, and going some places and setting up some meetings. So if you are interested in that, home groups, whatever, study groups, um, then I'm open to you. Uh, reach out. Anyway, this is just in the kind of the the planning stages. Also, I'm thinking about maybe some Facebook Live sessions uh, with you guys. If you're interested in something like that, um, that may work better than Skype. Uh, however, I want, you know, I just have a mind to um, be able to share with you more, share with you uh, in different ways than just the podcast. The podcast is great. I enjoy it. I love doing it. And I think you're uh, enjoying it as well. But I'm just having some thoughts of other ways we can do it. And so if you have any ideas or any of these things sound like uh, uh, ideas that you would also be interested in and, and they sound like something and you are like, yeah, do that. That sounds good. Uh, reach out to me with that. Uh, I'm, I'm open to um, suggestions, but just keep that in mind and I'll keep you updated. These things will uh, be updated and I'll get a little more <coughs> settled on them in the, in the coming weeks. So Again, thanks guys for listening. Thanks again for your uh, financial support. Uh, the way to give is in the description on the Podbean page in, in the description of each uh, episode. So you can look at that. Just thanks a lot, guys. And we'll end this by praying as we always do. That the God, our Father, the Father of light, the Father of glory, would open the eyes of our understanding flood our soul with his light that we may know the greatness of this great salvation that we have in Christ. Amen. Mm-hmm.